Okay, bonjour à tous, hello everyone. So I have the uh, difficult task of waking you up at the end of the day, and the second difficult task is repeating things that you already heard. I, I'm gonna try to do that, let's try. So the title of the talk is Pushing CSS to New Frontiers, and I'm going, I'm going to explain exactly what it means. We've discussed a lot of styling, we've discussed a little bit uh, preprocessors today, and I think that we can push a little bit CSS forward to new new stuff to address your needs. I mean, the, the people here in, in the audience. Uh, as I heard earlier today during a conference, during a speech, we're in the CSS, work, CSS working group, sometimes a little bit far away from the designers. Uh, when we hear the word designers, designer, sorry, we hear someone who writes CSS. We don't understand exactly the whole industrial thing behind. And that's, that's a totally different world. Some of us do understand it, the whole group as a whole, I'm not sure we do. So let's, let's explain that. Just to place a little bit the landscape, I don't know if all of you know that, the first proposal of CSS is more than 20 years old now, okay? As um, Chris said, it was suggested by uh, O'Connelly and Bert Boss at that time, and it took two years, a little bit than two years, to reach the first recommendation of CSS1. So CSS1 was between 12 and 15 pages, depending on the font. It was extremely weak, extremely simple, not paddable at that time. And we quickly felt the need to, to, to do much more than that. So the World Wide Web Consortium started a working group after the HTML ERB and the original HTML working group to handle style sheets. And that group did an amazing work. Uh, we moved CSS from 15 pages to 200 in less than two years. Uh, with a quite quick process, we must say. We didn't have any test suite, so we had a lot of things not implemented in the spec by any browser. And some, of, some other things were very weakly, very weakly interoperable, let's say. And it's the minimum I can say. So we, we, we took that spec again to CSS 2.1. It took us uh, 11 or 13 years, I don't remember exactly. And it took us another uh, 10 years to reach the first recommendations of CSS 3. And now, 21 years later, the first original proposal of CSS, we have more than 64, 65 uh, active documents on our radar in the CSS working group. So that's a huge work. It's a lot of things. Uh, and we have, let's say, 30-ish people active in the working group. So that explains why, in some cases, we, you consider we are a bit slow. Uh, I, I'm not saying this is an excuse. I'm saying it's one of the reasons why. 20 years later, what's the state of the onion? And I, it, it's not a mistake, it's because CSS has grown in circles. Um, in terms of APIs, we, we don't have a lot in CSS. We have the object model for the time being and not much more. The rest of the open web platform is the API frenzy. You have APIs for just everything. I mean, uh, the day uh, the web platform started touching uh, operating systems on mobile phones, that day APIs exploded. In terms of syntactic sugar, CSS variables, uh, the real name is uh, inherited custom properties or something like that, I never, I never remember it precisely, went to candidate recommendation today, this morning, after 18 years. The first time it was mentioned in the working group was at the end of 97. CSS is still about styling, only styling. I mean, it was mentioned multiple times during the day. Uh, the rest of the web platform is touching just everything. You have HTML and JavaScript, JavaScript in HTML, we're touching devices, screen, uh, the GPU, whatever you want. No, CSS is about style and formatting properties only. And extensibility, this is very simple, the extensibility of CSS is just zilch, non, nada, peanuts. While the rest of the open web platform is fairly extensible, as you know. 
So I'm not calling that a true success on the CSS side. It is a success. All of you are using CSS. There are millions and millions of websites using CSS, but we can do probably a little bit better. On the API side, let's take an example, the CSS object model. Let's put it bluntly, it sucks. It is extremely weak. The number of hacks you must work around when you deal with the object model is just tremendous. It's unbearable. Uh, it was never fully implemented. There are some areas of DOM2 CSS and DOM2 style that were never implemented at all or never interoperably implemented by browsers, which is worse. And some areas of the spec that were specified by consensus by the browser vendors were never implemented by them because after the publication of the document, they discovered they didn't want to do it. And a very good example of that is DOM views. So DOM views, you all played with that if you use the, the object model. When you write document.defaultView.getComputedStyle. Default view, why do you have that there? Because originally we thought that one single document tree could be rendered in multiple uh, physical displays, let's say, devices, uh, using several different style sheets, okay? You still have one single document tree, but you render it in different views, and the browser vendors ne never implemented that. Unfortunately, in 2015, we, had, we now have uh, initiatives in the World Wide Web Consortium called the Second Screen Initiative. And this is exactly about that. It's about two things. First thing, having synchronized display between two devices. And second thing, having only one device displaying on two screens. So we miss that now. Uh, it was predictable 15 years ago. Some of us said it, and nobody will, was willing to listen. So we end up with an object model that is completely unusable when you want to do very complex things. Uh, I don't remember who today said that they re-implemented entirely the object model in Macau, I think. Uh, it does not surprise me because uh, the object model of CSS is unusable. But it remains the ground layer for everything you do if you want to write a polyfill, an editor, uh, I'm sure Macau uses uh, 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 an object model extremely complex in terms of API to handle the style sheet and manipulate them and serialize. And all the web apps uh, have to use the object model too. So let's take uh, four random CSS issues, really random. First one, we have no selector object model. When you pass a style sheet, when you have a style sheet linked to your document, you cannot reach the parsed version of a selector. So if you want to tweak that selector, you have to pass it yourself and tweak it and reserialize it to, to push it to the style sheet. So something like that, no, it doesn't work, okay? Something like that, which is a visual editor for a selector, is doable only if you rewrite yourself a CSS selector parser and an object model for that. It doesn't feel normal. I mean, this, I, I wrote this for my editor, Blue Griffin, and this exists already in the rendering engine and it's impossible to use it. Something that you all do every day, you cannot climb up the cascade. Climbing up the, the, the cascade means when you have a given element, find the rules that are responsible for the, the styles that you, you, you see, the, the, the actual styles of the element, okay? You are all using that mechanism in the inspector of Firefox or Chrome. This is done in, in both Firefox and Chrome using proprietary interfaces available only to Chrome, JavaScript, and stuff like that. It's impossible for you to do that. You cannot reach that code. But it could be immensely useful, for instance, if you write uh, a 3D mapper just like the one we saw, and you want to change the style sheets and you want to know which rule is responsible for the color or the lightning or whatever you want, the, transform, the transformation of a given element. You cannot do that. You cannot access uh, the containing block, oh, sorry, the elements responsible for the containing block of a given box. 
This is a screenshot from Adobe Reflow, where you have a box inside the box, and the first one is relatively positioned to, to the, containing, the, the container, and you see the relationships on screen, and that is not easily available. You have offset element, but it's weak and, and absolutely not perfect. We don't have this kind of APIs that could be immensely useful to, to everyday use. CSS values that represent the values of a property in CSS is very weakly implemented, sometimes not implemented at all. Uh, so eventually all you get is, is a string, 12 pixels, 12 px, and it's your role to get the 12 and to get the px. No, sorry, we should provide an interface for that, uh, allowing you to know that it's, it's, it's a numeric, numerical unit and you get the unit on one hand and the, and the number on the other hand. And we should be able to do that for all the tokens that we use in CSS. We don't do that now or we do it only partially. In Firefox, I think that it's only available to specified style and not computed style, for instance. It should be available everywhere. And we have absolutely no control over serialization. When you want to serialize a, a CSS construct, you get CSS text, period, and you have to rely on it. They do their own stuff. You cannot indent, not indent, nest, whatever. It's impossible. So this is the serialization by a library called CSS Utils. It's so ugly that I wonder how, how they did it. I mean, this is, nobody is coding like that. Syntactic sugar, and I'm going to let you read that quote because I think we should read it several times during, your, during the year. Preprocessors are so important that I don't think a single web designer or CSS offer in industrial environment is not using it, okay? I've been the CTO of a web agency, so I know that perfectly. Uh, on another note, the CSS Working Group rarely discusses preprocessors. We have a few individuals bringing preprocessors features to the table. But as a whole, we don't consider them enough. Fortunately, we have Tab Atkins in the Working Group and he's pushing stuff like mixins and, and things. But uh, we, we always end up having blockers like this is going to block the progressive rendering, or uh, uh, this is turning CSS into a programming language, uh, or this breaks the purity of CSS. Who shall not pass? Um, okay. Unfortunately, the word is what uh, you are making of it. Uh, I, I always say that you are our users, okay? and a solution provider has to care for the users. And I think you have waited for too long, clearly. You need, and we should have, at least rule nesting, mix-ins, real constants, because I'm not sure that custom inherited properties, also known as variables, are enough for corporate needs. Reaching the variables in DOM to modify them is going to be pretty tricky. And just getting a, a list of hash defined in a corporate style sheet that you include in all the websites of the corporation and all the subsidiaries would do the trick. Um, we need inheritance, we need iterators. These ones are pretty complex in terms of object model because if they are immensely useful and reduce the size of CSS drastically, how do you pre represent them in the object model? I'm not sure we can. This is still a topic of discussion. But we need to improve that. We, we, we need to make this situation better. The first time we heard about variables was 18 years ago. The first time we heard about mix-ins was probably six or seven years ago. Rule nesting six or seven years ago doesn't feel normal. Impact, face panel. As I said, uh, CSS cares only about styles. There were a few attempts in the past to, to, 
to go beyond the fences of styling. Uh, we have two or three CSS-based languages in the world. Uh, one of them was Kyoto CSS, a second one, so it's for mapping. A second one was STTS, I'm going to talk about it, and I don't remember exactly the third, one, the third one. But it's extremely limited. CSS never went beyond the fences of style. But we all use at least selectors for many, many things. When you want to keep a pointer to an arbitrary element in a document, okay, you count the elements from the first child. So even if the element doesn't have an ID or a class, you can select it using nth child of something, okay? But people don't do that using CSS. They use XPath to do it. Why? It, XPath is extremely complicated. It's super powerful, but it's another language and you need to express your selecting mechanism in another formalism that you cannot reuse in the stuff that you're using every day like query, selector all. This is ridiculous. We should move to selectors everywhere and get rid of XPath. Um, CSS is still not patentable and we need to keep that. Uh, just, just a note for Chris Epstein. Um, not patentable does, does not mean easy. It means that it's readable. It's completely different and I want to keep it readable. I'm going to prove you that it's not always easy to keep it readable. So transformations. Uh, I don't see you, but raise your hand if you know what is XSLT. Okay, most of you, fine. Uh, XSLT is a proof of existence of the devil. Um, <laughs> to, it's, it's a template-based mechanism uh, written in XML that is so powerful that it can create PDF from HTML, uh, filter, rewrite, uh, completely transform anything. Uh, but it's also super complex. And as soon as you leave the very, very basic field of, of things you want to write in XSLT, you need to have an expert by your side. Because otherwise, it will take you weeks for the, for the simplest thing. So I, this is my personal feeling. XSLT is super powerful and should be limited for super powerful things. And for simpler things, we should build a CSS-based language doing transforms because we all master CSS. So at, reusing that syntax would be as readable as CSS is, as manipulable as CSS is, and it would be a hit. So let me show you a, a very concrete example. I'm not going to detail it. Imagine you have an HTML document with sections, H1s, multiple sections, H2. So it's well formed, okay? Well, it's well, well structured with sections, nested sections for each level, okay? This code, which is based on the CSS syntax, is automatically creating a table of contents in your document. There's no programming inside. You have no iterators. You have no variables. You're just calling stuff. By the way, there's a mistake. Sorry, I had no time to change it in the, in the slides that were sent today. The, one, two, four, five. The five pluses in the middle, H1 plus section, blah, blah, are not pluses. They are tildes. Uh, apart from that, this which is, I'm not going to detail it again, but it's based on the CSS syntax and it's automatic generation of content from your document. We can do it. And it's only one, two, three, four, five rules. So if we can create a table of content from any single well-architectured document in five lines of pseudo CSS, we can do much better than that. Extensibility. So this is Houdini, and I'm going to talk about Houdini again, because Houdini is probably the best thing that happened in CSS in 15 years, okay? Uh, the, 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 the term black box was mentioned multiple times. CSS is really a black box we are trying to open up. It's the only bit of the web platform that is not extensible. It's the only bit whose 
APIs have not changed since 98. And we, we really need to shake that landscape. We, we need to, to kick a few asses. Uh, we need to, to we need to work. We need to gather around tables and throw ideas on the table, whatever is the idea. Even if it's completely silly, maybe it's silly when you express it and something is going to pop out of it. Uh, we, we need to go beyond everything we have believed, we have been believing for 20 years, okay? We need to go beyond the model, the original model of the style engine isolated inside the rendering engine itself. So custom property values, uh, Chris showed uh, an example of it. It's to register new properties and new values based on a name, a syntax, does it inherit or not, and the initial value for the property. Uh, we are trying to, to go a little bit further and uh, define pseudo elements too, or pseudo classes, or um, uh, custom media queries, things like that, okay? Uh, in a very ideal world, you could trivially define your own media query, uh, linked to a JavaScript function returning a Boolean value. If it's true, the media query is true. If it's false, the media query is false. Unfortunately, there's some reluctance from the browser vendors to do that because calling the JavaScript uh, API every time would be probably a performance hit. But at least the idea is on the table and we're discussing this. Uh, we are for the time being doing that from JavaScript. So we register the values, the properties, the, the syntax, everything from JavaScript. I'm not so sure this is the right model because we have to do everything before the parser reaches a style sheet to pass your custom properties. And in my opinion, CSS is a language. I mean, if you want to define an extension to the language, let's define it in the language itself. Uh, let's have JavaScript too, but we should, we should put that in CSS. Parsing. Um, for polyfills, for instance, allowing new properties and new values is not enough. Let's say you want to create a new type of selector. Uh, and use a bang or, I don't know, a percent somewhere. I don't know, whatever you wish. So you cannot do that right now because uh, what we plan in Udini, the, the first documentation, um, is about properties only or rules, but not the, the, the atomic thing that is a selector. So to do that, you have two options. You extend the first bit I, I've been discussing or you reach the, the lexer of CSS to decompose yourself, the selector, to parse it into atomic things, and you will deal with your extension yourself. Why not? It, it's not decided yet, but it's something that, in my opinion, would be extremely useful because it would allow the CSS syntax to go beyond CSS and do things that are absolutely not styling. We also think about parsing a string based on a CSS grammar if, you, uh, if you've read a few specs and, and seen uh, how we define uh, constructs in CSS, the idea would be to pass a string containing this to the, to the parse method and in return get a structure or get uh, tokens we, we, don't, we don't know yet. And the last bit, what else? Uh, you have to tell me. Uh, so uh, Alan is the new co-chair of the working group, is the one who should receive your suggestion. Uh, we are really, really waiting for you here. Um, you are the guys willing to embed extensions, polyfills, frameworks, and, and you are the users again. Please tell us. So CSS values, as I said, uh, it w it's extremely weakly implemented in DOM, in, in DOM level 2, and we need to do much better. In DOM level two, if we have, in theory, the decomposition of 12 pixels, 12, p 12 on one side and unit pixel on another one, the new things we added to CSS are, are not in there. For instance, a linear gradient with multiple arguments between the parentheses, okay? If you want to tweak that in a, in a web app, you need to reach each individual argument to tweak it, okay? and reserialize. You don't want to do that yourself. 
It's completely pointless. It's extra work, it's extra bandwidth, it's, 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 it's pointless. Uh, we don't have this kind of compound value storing multiple values inside. It's absolutely not implemented right now. So we need to have it and have it correctly specified and correctly implemented for once. The box tree, it's an access to the geometry, the text, the fragments, and the boxes that compose the physical mapping of an element onto the viewing device. Uh, an API, so that's painting, the painting API, to let you define your own painting on the, on, onto the frame buffer. For instance, you want to define an extension that is a pseudo element representing the last line of a paragraph. As you know, we have the first line. We don't have the last line. You want to do it. You will have to reach out to the, the last fragment, the last anonymous box of your paragraph to paint it. Okay? This mechanism will allow you to do it. Will, will allow you to do it. And something that is also under consideration is a scrolling API. Because scrolling now is, is much more powerful than just navigating vertically or horizontally in your document. For instance, if you, if you take a mobile phone and, and the, if you take the, the native app of the local newspaper Le Monde to refresh the, the news, you scroll to the, to the bottom, you keep it scrolled for a while, you release, and it's an action. And we're, we're currently quite unable to do that and style it. Uh, it's very complex. It has to be natively implemented. It's very painful. We, we, we may want to, to, to do styling on this. So conclusion. CSS is not only about styling a document tree. And it's the only thing we, we really cared about uh, during the last 20 years, unfortunately. Uh, it's also about giving you the right environment to do your work and, and to, to, to push the web forward and, and push the limits all the time. So it's our role to consider you better. It's our role to consider better what the industry uses on a daily basis. And when, you, when we see there's a, 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 such a gap in, in the technology that all of you is using something and none of us are considering it for specification, then we have a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much.